everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Ketty and I'm the co-founder and current head coordinator of the Waterville Seed Library, which is a totally free public resource that gives community members the ability to grow their own food at no extra cost. Um, and before I introduce our speaker tonight, I want to give a quick overview of the lecture timeline. So Will will talk for 45 to 50 minutes and then we'll set aside the last 10 to 15 for your questions. Um, so if you have questions, you can use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen if you hover over it um, at any time during the lecture. And then I will have those questions ready to ask Will at the end for you all. Um, additionally, Will will be giving one final lecture on pollination control when purity matters on May 3rd which is another Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, and if you're interested in watching any of these lectures, the past first lecture or this one, um, we're recording them and you can watch them on the Waterville Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, and to the main event, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Will Bonzel for the second of a three-part series. Uh, Will is a resident of Industry Maine, but he is originally from Waterville. He's known for directing the Scatter Seed Project, which is an operation that has been ongoing for more than 40 years and has a mission of growing a diverse array of crops in order to protect diversity and connect people with their horticultural heritage. Currently, the Scatter, Scatter Seed Project collects, maintains, and distributes thousands of varieties of crop plants, many of them rare or endangered. In addition to farming and seed saving, Bonzel is an active author, and I think we'll get to see a little bit of his books tonight. Um, his works include Through the Eyes of a Stranger and Will Bonzel's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening. Will Bonzel is a huge seed legend in Maine and we're so happy to have him here to talk with us today. Thank you, Will. And thank you, Ketty, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to be here. As Ketty mentioned, Waterloo is my hometown and it's nice to reconnect, even though I now uh, live only about the three quarters of an hour away from there. Um, so yeah, as Katie mentions, I am the director of a thing called the Scatter Seed Project, and a lot of my focus for the last 40 or 50 years has been um, collecting and preserving and distributing seed or propagules, whatever it be, cuttings or whatever, of thousands of different uh, varieties of things. And that's very exciting, and I think it's very important, but I'm always sometimes daunted by the fact that uh, there's not much point in my simply offering varieties, particularly rare varieties that are not available from a seed company that I'm perhaps the only source of, um, if I'm just sending them out to people who are going to grow them and eat people like yourselves to um, be saving your own seeds. Because unlike a seed company who's very happy to have you come back year after year, I don't want you to. I'm very happy to provide you with things with the assumption that you're going to uh, hopefully um, hopefully share it with your friends and neighbors and so on. So you, in fact, become a source of that. And so that's one of the reasons why a big part of my focus in my Scatter Seed Project has been um, teaching people how to save their own. And thence we're here tonight, and that's wonderful. And last time uh, I dwelt at some length on why it's so important to save your own seeds and some of the specific how to, some of the details about uh, saving your seeds, selecting the plants, um, things such as uh, how to process the seed um, and storing the seeds and so forth. Um, tonight, I wanna go on to a somewhat more complicated um, facet of seed saving. And that is those particular crops for which it takes more than one year to uh, get a seed crop. These are some species which take two years to complete their full uh, life cycle. Um, we call them biennials. And um, there's some good reasons why uh, biennials do the biennial thing. Uh, they typically grow in places where parts of the world where the climate is not so severe, but what they can survive. Usually it survive a cold, a winter or something. Um, but on the other hand, they find it uh, useful apparently to spend a whole year bulking up, so to speak, um, making a big mass of tissue, a big root or a big stalk or something, uh, some kind of energy storage facility, uh, uh, 
piece feature so that when they do finally get in a family way, finally when they go to go to their sexual phase, they've got a lot of energy to do it with and they can be much more robust, more productive in doing it. Um, one of my favorite examples of a biennial and well, in general, I usually describe all biennials. Basically a biennial is an annual in denial. Um, it's a crop that thinks it's a perennial. It thinks it's got forever to um, make seed and, and provide for its posterity, for its, uh, for its future beyond itself. And, um, and it's fooling itself. It cannot live forever. It's got a, uh, sooner or later it's got to get down to business and make a family. Well, if it's so smug and set in its ways about um, living forever, then it needs some kind of a arm twisting, some kind of a incentive to say, hey, you're not immortal. You better get with it here. And so that's what uh, that's what this thing is that we call um, vernalization. It's basically a reality check, a wake up call for a species. One of my favorite examples I usually like using of a biennial is a rutabaga. Now, the rutabaga is um, most of you, perhaps, or at least like myself, uh, growing up in the 50s and so on, um, we frequently had New England boiled dinner and we had along with, we had turnip. We always had turnip with it. Well, I did not realize until I, I was in my mid 20s that I had never ever eaten and never tasted a true turnip. The things that we called turnips are actually rutabagas. And uh, this, aside from the fact that it's a biennial, there's an interesting story to the rutabaga in that the, the rutabaga is one of those few species which does not exist in nature. It would not exist if it were not for human involvement. And how it happened, uh, relatively reasonable in terms of plant history, uh, probably sometime in the 16th century, perhaps even earlier. Um, a species called turnip, true turnip, Brassica rapa, which originated in Central and Southwestern Asia, spread out from there with, with, with people, with agriculture, took it to, east to the Orient and west into Eurasia and Europe, where it became very popular, particularly in the Baltic region and Scandinavia, um, particularly as a livestock food, but people ate it too, the turnip, um, which Brassica rapa, which by the way is closely related, but a different species from another species which grew wild in the Baltic region called colwort. Colwort, by the way, is, um, Brassica oleracea, and it is the ancestor of many crops that we call the cabbage family. Uh, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, um, cauliflower, broccoli, collards, I don't know, I've still mentioned all of them, Brussels sprouts. These are all simply morphisms of the, of the colwort. And one of them has uh, a chromosome number of nine, and the other one has a chromosome number of 27. And given the, uh, excuse me, uh, nine and 18, I should say. And given that the odds of their uh, ever cross pollinating and making offspring are, you might say one in a million. Well, when you stop and think about it, um, if you have uh, um, millions of bees carrying billions of uh, from some sort of, uh, coal work plants surrounding some farmer's turnip field, uh, when we say once in, one in a million, I mean several times every season. And a few of these actually made fertile offspring, unlike the, the, the mule, which is a hybrid of the horse and the donkey. Uh, th this particular um, hybrid uh, made occasionally viable offspring with 27 chromosomes, I believe it is. Okay, so that's how it came into existence. But uh, therefore, it does not exist in nature. You'll know, know where we can go and find wild rutabagas. Wild turnips, yes. Wild kale, yes, but not wild rutabagas. And so, um, so they're native to that corner of the world, mainly the Baltic region. So this tells us a lot about what they need for a, an environment to thrive in, and especially to do their whole life cycle, to their uh, adolescent and sexual phase and to, to maturing seed and so forth. Um, I sometimes think of a, a, a rutabaga, I sometimes like to picture a, a rutabaga growing in some, let's say some Swedish farmer's garden. Uh, field. And um, well, for one thing, the rutabaga needs this thing called vernalization. It needs some kind of a winter to, as I said before, to, to convince it that it's not immortal. It needs enough of a winter to give it a wake up, but it can't be such a bad winter that it cannot survive it. A main winter 
would be extremely challenging for a rutabaga. Maybe the mid-coast area where I am um, in the Farmington area, rutabagas would rot and freeze today. So um, Maine winter is not the same as a Danish winter, for example. A Danish winter, yeah, they get some snow, it's chilly, foggy, a lot of weather, but not so bad, but what a rutabaga can survive it. So I'm picturing myself being a rutabaga in some Danish garden. And I'm growing and I'm looking around me and I'm saying, oh, it's sunny, a lot of foggy weather, uh, nice rich soil. And I'm gonna say, yeah, this is wonderful. I'm going to live forever. Why should I ever get an ephemeral way? Why should I mess with the diapers and all that stuff? Uh, I would just keep growing. And so it's smug, it keeps just putting mass on, putting on fat. Think of a, a turnip, a rutabaga root, big mass of energy that's storing, it's putting it in the bank. And therefore it gets as, uh, as uh, fat and smug as a Danish banker. It's got a lot socked away from, from bad times and it feels very good about itself. But then along comes a winter, albeit a Danish winter. It sits there in a the garden, shivering and really uncomfortable through the winter and spring when it finally comes warm again. The rutabaga looks around and says, oh, human, that was terrible. I don't know if I could survive too many more of those. I better get an ephemeral way. And so it does. Then, and only then, does it send up flower stalks and, and, and eventually a seed may form seeds. It needs that experience, has to have it. And so I remember many years ago, I got a, a letter from a, a German fellow who lived in New Orleans area. And he was complaining, he tried to save seeds from his rutabagas and said, they just kept making greens, all greens, all through the winter and the second they just make greens. And I said to him, I suggest what you need to do is dig those up, knock some of the dirt off, but no, don't cut the top off at all. And uh, cut the foliage off, put it in the vegetable drawer of your refrigerator for a matter of weeks, then take it and plant it and see what happens. Well, he did and he told me later, oh, made all kinds of seeds. It had to have that vernalization, had to have that reality check. And so things like carrots, parsnips, parsley, all of those um, things, those biennials, they need to have that reality check, but they have to be able to survive it. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so um, that's one of the key features of all of the um, biennials is that they need some kind of a dormancy thing, a chilled, so, so much chill time to make them stop putting on flesh, stop making leaves and do their sex thing. Um, so then given that we're in Maine and not in Denmark and a, Maine, and a Maine winter is not the same as a Danish winter, we need to somehow, for most crops, we need to create a Danish winter. We have to make a situation which is a little milder. Some things know, um, parsnips, anyone who grows parsnips know perfectly well that they do fine overwintering out in the garden under the snow and ice and all that. Um, and then you dig them up in the spring, either to eat them or to grow seed. In much of the state, you could do that with carrots. Certainly mid coast area people very often I hear they had carrots overwinter in that garden. Um, maybe you can where you are. I can, can pretty much count on them being frozen to mush uh, in the course of the winter. Um, you can mulch them with often with success, but whatever you mulch them with, with is probably going to be a very welcome home for rodents, voles, moles, something or other, which would love to eat those carrots or whatever it is, beets, turnips. Um, so what I have to do and what most of you may have to do is to create a place which is somewhat like a Danish winter. And by that, I mean a root cell. In my case, that's very easily done. My cellar is an old, it's a, it's a dirt floor, uh, no poured concrete. The walls are all laid up rocks, um, close to freezing every winter. Not freezing, that's important, but close to freezing. And it's very damp and uh, chilly down there. That's the absolute perfect place to store biennials. Most of you perhaps have a concrete poured cellar with an oil furnace down there. Well, you got trouble. Um, you need to somehow surmount that problem. And one way I've known, I, I did it myself for a few years, if you're in a that kind of a house, is to, uh, for one thing, petition off a corner of your cellar um, and insulate it so that it is not affected by the oil furnace. If it happens to be a cellar window, window there that you can insulate, but not too thoroughly, that might be nice. Um, and then the other thing that I've done is uh, put out a couple of inches of sawdust on the floor, on the cement floor, and pour a bucket of water on that. So you've got a damp, chilly, damp um, environment. Most things will store just fine in that situation because you've made something a bit more like a Danish winter. Let's say um, you've got these things growing in your garden. 
And uh, the example I'm going to use now, I'm not sure quite why, but let's talk about carrots. Um, you've grown a whole crop of carrots. You've got a bushel or a couple of bushels of carrots in your cellar, and you like to save some of them, certainly not all of them, you grow them to eat after all, but you want to save 20 or 30 of them maybe to grow a lot of seed for next year and maybe for the next year to come and several years and maybe to share with your friends, uh, whatever, you'd like to get a lot of seed from it. So you will select, when you're harvesting a crop, you will select the ones that look like what you want. Let's say a word about selection. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons that even if you're overwintering your crop like parsnips in the garden, in situ, over the winter, you still, in the springtime, will most certainly want to dig them up for two reasons. But the one which I'm getting at right now is to select them because all of your parsnips are probably be better if you didn't say from all of them. Some of them are better than others. In what way? That's for you to decide. You are when you're a seed saver, you're automatically being to some extent a seed breeder, plant breeder, because you are making decisions. If you didn't make them, uh, Mother Nature will make them for you. Uh, but in any case, you decide which of these um, not what that right is known for. Maybe the best ones are the little ones. So the smallest ones, you, the biggest ones you would not want to save seed from. You will decide what your selection basis is and you'll save those plants that meet your criteria and the rest you'll eat perhaps. You'll reject for seed. Um, so that's one reason for digging your crop, whether it's in the fall or in the spring. Another reason is <laughs> you, you think you know, uh, a carrot, you know how big it is, but it takes about two, three inches of space in the garden. The second year, it's a very, very different story. Uh, the first year, you're only seeing your plants up to their adolescence. Most gardeners grow carrots year after year after year, and they never see a carrot seed that didn't come out of the packet. They never see a carrot blossom. Um, um, but you've got to allow the second year when you plant them out to go to seed. You need to allow a lot more space. Um, carrots typically might take at least two feet of row uh, between plants in the row. So those plants you originally had at two or three inches apart, you've got to plant, replant them in a different place probably, um, but with much more spacing. So those, that's the second reason for digging up your biennials in the fall or in the spring to select and to give them proper spacing. So uh, I think now we want to talk a little about storing your thing. If you're already in the habit of growing beets, carrots, turnips, or whatever, and you have a way of storing them, whatever you're doing in the cellar, or if you have a, some kind of an arrangement for storing them, refrigerator or whatever, then that's fine. That same thing will work for, for overwintering them for seed. Um, some things you want to do a little different, perhaps. For example, if you're growing, back to rutabagas again, one of my favorite crops. Um, rutabagas that, uh, when you buy turnips or rutabagas in the store, you may notice the crown is always cut off from them. They, that's what they call the spring, the area where the, the place where the root joins the sky is the spring. That's, that's the, where all the new growth uh, emerges from that area. And if you want to sell the rutabagas and you don't want them to sprout in storage and get soft, then cut that off. Sure, they'll keep much better that way. And then also you dip them in hot wax if you're trying to do a commercial, that's, that's how they do it. But one way or the other, you cut that spring off. If you're saving them from seed, uh-uh. It's very important that you keep that intact. With beets, the same thing. Cut off the foliage, but don't cut into that crown. You will do great mischief to, to the crop by doing that. Um, and so, so you harvested your, your crop and um, and then you're going to store it. And again, if the ideal place is in some kind of a uh, root cellar, if you don't have the arrangement that I have and you don't create a uh, whole room, another possibility that some people use, I haven't tried it myself, is what's called sometimes a clamp for some reason. Basically, the usual way of doing it, it's kind of a funky temporary, uh, this year only, above ground root cellar. And one way of doing it is you take some bales of hay you buy from a dairy farmer and you, and as you are a dairy farmer, you take some hay and make a wall, basically make three sides. And well, four sides, but you leave the fourth one open. You want to pull that bale out. And you may make it the two bales high possibly, 
Uh, then you might put a piece of plywood on top of the whole thing for a roof and then put more bales of hay on top of that. You're making kind of a, I think of it kind of as a cubic igloo of, of, uh, of hay. And, uh, and then you put your roots in there and you shove that bale back in to plug it up. Um, it, it's not convenient. This is not a great way of storing your food. I don't think for the winter for eating because it's rather awkward to get at that. Once it freezes up and that thing is covered with snow, it may be not very convenient to get in there to get the things out every week you want some carrots or something. But if you're not gonna be going in there again till spring when the green, grass is green and everything's snow is all gone, then that's one way of doing it. Uh, the only problem I know of with it is rodents. If you're putting things in there, it's ideal if you can put them in, uh, you know, metal trash can on his side or something some, something so that um, or maybe put screening around the entire thing including the bottom you want to keep rodents from getting in there and ruining it but uh, that's one way of doing it and I've heard people say they've had some very good results with it you've got to somehow or other you've got to do whatever it takes to get those first year plants to overwinter and survive into the second year the next spring in good condition okay let me say a little bit for a minute about good condition in the cellar these things, turnips, carrots, leeks, charred beets, whatever it be, will store quite well. Again, you've cut off most of the foliage. I should have said a little bit more about that. If you're storing things like charred plants, which by the way, is the same species as beets. With beets, you simply cut off the foliage, leaving a fraction of an inch of stem on it, and that's fine. With charred, you should do the same. Um, but the beets, you can just put those in, I usually put mine in a plastic feed bag with a label stake in it. So, cause I'm doing many varieties of beets, for example, so to keep uh, the identification clear on each of them. Um, and then I put them in 50 gallon uh, oil carrots, turnips, those things that have the big hard ball root on them. But what about kale, um, cabbage, leeks, uh, chard? Those things have a lot of foliage and they don't have a big hard ball. Uh, most of those things that I've mentioned, I usually plant, I replant them in a plastic bucket. I have a really good example for you right here. So this is going to help me to focus on this. Okay, here it is. This bucket. Okay, there we go. Go up to the top a little. Yeah. You see a lot of yellow flowers at the top, a little higher. Okay. Over here is where the, there we go. Okay. They're flowering, even though they haven't yet been replanted in the ground yet, for God's sakes. They're flowering. They're so eager to. And as you come back, down and see this is all what was kale plants last year but as you see they're all ligging out now and uh, and that's good now if that had happened um in the winter in the cellar that would have been a bit of a problem they were short like little kale plants like they were in the garden last fall but as winters Fierce grip breaks out to a waxing spring sun rising, starts to penetrate into your cellar more and more. Then these things all have a clock ticking that says, hey, spring's coming, let's get started. And they may start too soon. And these things may, um, I've got a rutabaga here. Okay. The rutabaga is still nice and very good to be long long before it will take, if I want it for seed, which it wasn't my idea, I wanted to sweat food, but it's uh, taking energy out of the thing. Um, then uh, then what sometimes happens if these are in a closed, like a plastic bag, like I mentioned, uh, uh, feed bag, then what happens in this sprout will tend to wrap around and around the thing because it doesn't know which direction it goes in the dark. And so it may be a little, uh, see, trying to pull those things out of there without, uh, ripping them apart, bring them out a little before that. There's still snow on the ground maybe. Um, and I'll bring them out of the cellar and bring them out into the light. Um, whether it's the kale plants in a bucket or the uh, rutabagas in a feed bag, I'll often bring them out just when there's maybe a little bit of some bare spot in the backyard and lay them down there. You say they're gonna freeze. Well, these things are very cold hardy. They pr almost could have survived just in the garden outside. So obviously it's not gonna kill them if you put them out in April, put them out and they get a lot of cold weather. They would like that weather, not so much the cold as the sun and the breeze because the sun and the breeze gives them a taste of the real world and it starts doing, for one thing, as you saw the difference between the rutabaga and the kale, it turns, starts forming chlorophyll that's in there, starts acting and turning green. That's very good, this pale blanched sprout. 
okay, may be very tender and mild to eat the sprout, actually be very, very tasty, but also very crisp and succulent and not very strong. A little breeze would break it over. So, uh, so the normal breeze and sunlight will start to form some fiber and some chlorophyll and toughen this thing up. So I'd like to bring them out um, a bit earlier um, and let them start hardening up. So, um, okay, so let's see where to go from here. Um, so we've got them through the winter, we've got them outside, and I'm gonna emphasize again, it's very important that you did cut off that crown, that spring for whatever this is. Um, otherwise, uh, the thing isn't gonna grow at all. It'll probably rot. Um, there are some ways, by the way, of, uh, you know, when you grow a carrot, and if you don't have, well, let's say cabbage, let's say you grow 50 cabbages, and for eating, for crowding, and for making coleslaw, whatever you, you that's how much your family would use in here. But if I tell you, you need to use at least 10 or 20 of those for seed in order to get enough of a population um, base there. You don't have plant seed from too few plants. You will not have the genetic diversity of one. So geez, you say, well, gosh, well, yeah, I, I was, that means I gotta plant half of my crop or all of my crop and not have any left to eat. Well, uh, yeah, that's tough for some things. Uh, in the case of cabbage, uh, I can give you a hint of how you can have your cake and eat it too, or rather have your cabbage and eat it too. I learned this from a friend in Sweden who was curator of a cabbage collection there. He explained how he would take, pull up the cabbage, pull off all those loose floppy outer leaves, send them off to compost, knock off most of the loose dirt from the root ball, and then carefully lay this thing down on a cutting board on the table, like lay it down sideways, being careful to not tip it upside down so you get dirt falling off from the root ball. And then he takes a knife and slabs off the side of, of it. When I say slabs off, being careful not to damage that core, that conical core in the middle of the head, which sometimes is very short and depending on the type of cabbage maybe, that's where the new growth comes from. That's in a sense, that is the stalk of the cabbage covered with this uh, growth of, of tightly wrapped leaves. And so you chop off what you've got uh, from the top, bottom, all the sides, turn it around. So all you have left is that cone and the short bit of stalk and the root ball. Well, that's fine. Now, of course, you're not going to store that cabbage you cut off, but you can chop it up, freeze it, sauerkraut it, coleslaw, whatever, or use it right away. So you can, to some extent, have your cake and eat it too. It won't be good to store anymore, of course. Um, and there are some other cases like that. But basically, uh, the carrot that you save for seed will not be good for food. It'll get all withery and cracked and bitter and so forth. Uh, a good point to mention, as many of you may be aware, that carrot is closely related to, more than closely related to, Queen Anne's lace that grows in fields all around Waterville area, I know very well, and all around the state. Uh, the fields are full of Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace is often referred to as wild carrot. Technically, that's not correct. It's more accurate to say it is feral carrot. It is domestic carrot gone wild because carrot was not native to the New World. It was brought over from the Eastern Mediterranean and Southwestern um, Asia and so forth. It originated there, spread into Western Europe and was brought over by French, English, Dutch settlers and so on to the New World and spread from there. Um, anyway, it will cross with your domestic carrots and will ruin the quality of the seed from them will be useless, bitter, uh, horrible, uh, not useful plants. Um, so, so it's, let's say it's springtime and we've now managed to get these things out. And as I said, um, you've selected for them. Keep in mind, please, that selection happens. You may, you may say, I'll just take whatever I've got. Well, whatever you've, you've got is already a matter of natural selection. The fact that you're gardening in, in central Maine instead of in Cyprus or something. Um, the fact that you're growing maybe organically as opposed to not or vice versa. Um, the fact that you're growing in very fertile soil as opposed to not. Whatever the conditions are that this thing is growing in will affect which plants do the best, which make the most seed. So I say selection happens. If it's going to happen anyway, why don't you take the wheel and control? Select for the things that you want, not just let it randomly do what it wants, which may or may not suit your purpose. So have a clear idea of what you're selecting for and go for it. Now, we've got the seeds through the winter, uh, through this artificial Danish winter, that is to say our main cellar or wherever we, we're doing. Um, I would mention before, I wasn't quite complete enough when I said that a few things like parsnips can overwinter right in the garden. Um, Chicory generally will do that. Generally not the radicchio types of chicory, but Whitlow chicory, the type that's used for 
forcing for his, for his chickens or for coffee making and stuff. That type will generally went over winter very well in the field. In fact, the uh, when I was growing up on Bowtell Avenue, uh, the ditch in front of the house had all kinds of wild chicory growing there that went wild from some some cultivated garden chicory, I assume. Um, those kinds of chicories are quite hardy and could be just left in the ground. Parsley, eh, sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no. Uh, if you're nearer to the coast, you can count on parsley overwintering every single year, but I don't find it that reliable. Uh, and so on, some things will do pretty well, but generally uh, for, to be reliable, kale plants, many people have some kale overwinter in their garden. I will usually have a few, but I cannot count on it. So again, I'm relying on an artificial um, Danish winter to, uh, to store most of those crops. So you've got it through the springtime and you've taken the number of plants out and you've selected for the ones that you want. Um, and, and you put them back in the, in the you're gonna replant them back in the ground. If you are much more wise than I am, which most of you are, you're only gonna save seed from one cabbage variety, from one rutabaga variety. <clears throat> So you don't have to worry about it, about it. We'll be talking a lot about this in our next presentation, which I think is in June, I guess. Um, things which may cross pollinate. Um, if you're growing several varieties of carrots, for example, and you want to save seed, they all went through the winter, you want to save all of them, then you've got another issue to deal with, which we'll talk about then, keeping them all pure. Um, but uh, assuming that you don't, then you can just have them go in your garden. I guess where I'm going with this is if you are going to have more than one, you could have one of them growing in your garden. Off in the corner, you could replant them and you know have them going to seed. And then if you get a second variety, you might have it off somewhere else, but far enough away so it won't cross pollinate, and far enough away from any Queen Anne's lace so it won't cross pollinate. So that's that's a thing to consider. But if you don't need that, then you just replant it in the ground. Um, trying to think of all the details here. If you, most of these things, since you're planting something which already has a screen, it always has a, a zone where the, like I say, where the, excuse me, where the uh, greens, where the sprouts came from and where the, the greens originated. Um, that point generally does not want to be buried, at least not deep. In fact, in many cases, as the case of a rutabaga, um, usually what I'll do is plant, replant it about, the depth that it was when it was growing, which usually means about half ground. I may bury most of it. Usually I'll bury most of it, but not the spring. Keep that up where the light gets on it um, because it will initiate new sprout growth much better than if the thing is, it won't come up too much dirt. Um, if you're planting parsley, you would like to have it so that just the spring is above ground and all that root is, is nicely covered. Otherwise it'll dry out and so on. Um, it's hard to know how much to tell you about this there. Every single crop is different, but you wanna bury it deep enough, which usually means at least as deep as it grew last year and often somewhat more so. Again, you're going to um, put your plants much further apart. I mean, much further apart. Um, beets, beets in your garden, you know, like what, three, four inches in diameter at the very most. The second year, and, and the plant has got a tuft of leaves, maybe, you know, at the most, a foot across, at the very most. No, no. In the second year, those things are going to look like bloody uh, tumbleweeds. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be huge. They may be three feet in every direction. I knew of a fellow up in, over in New Brunswick who grew um, rutabagas commercially for seed, and he had them spaced four feet in every direction, and he staked them. That's the other thing with biennials. Be ready to stake your carrots, your leeks, your radishes your beets, who stakes these? Well, in the second year, you very likely may need to, otherwise they may flop over and sprawl and, not, and break over and not do well. So you probably wanna put a, a, albeit rather a lightweight stick in there to tie the things to, to support them. Um, and again, they're gonna be far apart, much further apart than the, you, you would have them during the growing season, um, their first growing season. In there, again, <laughs> looking back at this, rutabaga plant and m most of the things that you've got you're putting out this spring they were nice to eat last fall last winter yeah, that's where you grew them you've been eating them hoping other animals won't eat them well in the springtime when the succulent new growth comes up hey candy store every animal uh deer rabbit woodchuck anyone in the neighborhood is so much after those tender young things moreover anything in the crucifera family uh turnips or cabbage family things um, they're dearly loved by flea beetles. 
early in the spring, flea beetles will come on and sometimes decimate them by peppering those so much with holes. So you need to do a little protection and probably the best protection against all of those things um, is some kind of a row cover, screen or uh, reme, uh, nylon gauze, something which will not only protect them from insect uh, pests, but also most animal pests will be daunted by that for a while. You can't do that for too long because the thing's going to, again, it's bolting, it's shooting up through it. And if you've got that thing, that cover fastened down too much, then these things are going to be repressed. They're going to get all bent over and stuff like that. So you need, at some point, you have to either take them off altogether or um, loosen them up with stakes, something, a frame, something around to keep the cover so there's room for the plants to grow. At some point, at some point, you must remove it altogether. At what point? Before they blossom because almost all of these biennial things I'm talking about, with the main exception of beets and chard, which are wind pollinated. Uh, most of these other things are pollinated by various insects, honeybees, surfed wasps, common house flies, various things. And if those blossoms are inside of a screen, ain't nothing gonna happen. You're not gonna get any seed at all. You may get tons of flowers, but no seeds. Um, and so make allowance for, for protecting whatever they need, protecting them from extreme wind, um, from too crowding, from the various pests that will bother them. Um, okay, so then um, you've, you've got them grown and um, well, I think I've already dwelt on this somewhat. One single plant, uh, beets for example, one single plant that's um, four inch, three, three inches across, let's say, just a beet like you cut up to make some soup out of. Um, Two of those plants will give you enough seed for the whole county. I mean, they're, they're prolific seed makers, huge amounts of seed in one plant. Two plants, I should say. One plant will give you nothing. Uh, I'm stealing my own thunder a little bit here on the next class, which is dealing with um, pollination issues. But um, some of these things are self-sterile, and which means that a blossom, even though it has both girl and boy parts in the same blossom, will not pollinate itself. So if you have one single cabbage plant, let's say, or kale plant, two kale plants may give you tons of seed. One plant will typically give you none. Uh, to get enough genetic diversity plus quantity and quality of seed, you would really be well off to have a number of plants, half a dozen, 20, the more the better actually, except that of course you're growing these to eat, so you want to save some food. Um, and so, um, so you've managed to get this through a winter, You've managed to get it out and protect it from the animals and insects and stuff. And um, hopefully this is going to bolt and give you lots and lots of seed. Um, I went into this a little bit last year, but I think it last time, but I think it bears a little re uh, repeating. Biennials are bodacious producers of seed. Leeks and onions, not so much so, but even they are in proportion to the, seed, the space they take. You're gonna get so much uh, seed from these things that you're going to want to, it's going to be much more than you need for next year. So uh, as I mentioned before, storing it, if you have too much, sharing it with friends, uh, whatever you want to do with it. But if you want to store it, uh, storing it in a freezer is a great way of storing it, um, assuming you let it get very, very dry before you put into storage. Uh, dry so the pods, if it's, in, if it's pods that you're dealing with, they shatter, um, but so that you end up with pure seed that's very, very dry, and you put it in a freezer in a moisture-proof, air-proof um, container. It's a block packet with a tape on the outside or a glass jar uh, that's a well canning jar that's a good seal, uh, then you can store it that way. And as I mentioned before, when you take that seed out to plant it next year, don't simply open up the jar, take out the seed you want, close it back up and put it away. Uh, it may seem like that seed was very dry and indeed was very dry when you put it in for winter. Open that up in whenever, um, April or March or something to, to uh, plant it. Um, and it was very, very cold. The seed was freezing. You brought it out into the kitchen table, let's say, where it seemed to me like the air was plenty, plenty dry, but no, there was some moisture in the air. And that moisture is going to condense on those very cold seeds. And when you put them back in, they look exactly the same, but they're now nowhere near as dry and they're not going to store as well. So be cautious of that little fact. So with some things, this is a bit of a digression, but uh, I think it's important because as I mentioned, with many of these things, you're growing so much seed than you're gonna need. Let's say with kale, you, you've now got 
a pound of seed, let's say, you know, from six or eight plants, and you only need a fraction of an ounce for next year. So uh, aside from, as I mentioned, keeping it for several years in a freezer, there's other things you can do with some of these. And I'm particularly talking about the cabbage family, uh, all of the cabbage group, including turnips, rutabagas, and including um, other cruciferous like radish seeds. Let's say you've got a ton of these seeds and you can't use it all. Guess what? There's something very nice you can do with them. You can eat them in the form of sprouts. Those things are lovely sprouted. Uh, get yourself a sprouting jar, put it in your sink and, and grow, it, grow those sprouts. So uh, it's also, it doesn't matter if you've grown too much seed, you're also growing food. That doesn't work at everything. Parsnip seed isn't worth eating. Carrot seed, I don't think, most of those seeds aren't, aren't good for food, but some of them are and that, that makes it very uh, convenient when you have much too much. Okay, um, before I forget, I wanted to, I did this last time, I'm gonna do it again. Um, refer you to some reference materials that will help you to go in, in more depth and also to have this material all available at your convenience. Um, one that comes to mind, the first one I pick up here because of its size, is this book by my good friend over in Vermont, uh, James Uliger. And a good thing about this book, Beginning Seed Saving for the Home Gardener. The emphasis on beginning. Uh, Jim goes into enough detail, but lays off the jargon and does not overwhelm you with information that you don't particularly need to know and don't and are daunted by. His big goal is to not daunt you, not put you off from doing this. Um, here's a much more sophisticated book by my friend John Navazio. <clears throat> and it is called, I think that shows it enough, and it is called The Organic Seed Grower, Farmer's Guide to Vegetable Seed Production. Um, very in-depth, good, big, heavy book, well worth it. Um, and for when you want to get deeper into it, you want that book. And in some ways, uh, one of the encyclopedias of seed saving, uh, one of the best known books widely is, uh, whoops, that's not the one I've got here, but I can tell you about it. I thought I had it here. Suzanne Ashworth's book, Seed to Seed, um, available through, among other sources, the Seed Savers Exchange, who publish it. Um, Suzanne goes into very great depth and in, is a whole lot of crops, including many that you wouldn't think of growing in Maine. Uh, she's in Sacramento, California, and she's very, very thorough, very about uh, seed saving and different things. And for what it's worth, not to uh, promote myself here, but um, this book of mine, which Ketty referred to, Will Bonsall's um, Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening. I have to look at the cover every time I say it because it wasn't my, my choice for a title for it. I had a different idea, but this is what the publisher wanted. So it's not something I can wrap my tongue around real easily. But anyway, uh, this goes into all aspects of, of, of self-reliant gardening. And there's a unit in there on sexual propagation of plants. In other words, seed saving, which I'd like to say is very good. And you, you might enjoy that too. And there's a whole lot more in it. So those are some sources that are available to, to you, whatever stage you're at and want to go with this. Um, so uh, to recap a bit, the key things to keep in mind with biennials, uh, and some, I don't think I've yet mentioned enough about what are the biennial crops. Um, many of them are obvious, but um, in the umbellifera uh, or the APAC group as they're now called, um, quite a few of them are biennials, parsnips, uh, parsley, carrots, um, caraway, some of the herb, herbal spice uh, carrot family things uh, are, need two years. Uh, celery and celeriac. Um, in the crucifera family, most of them are. All of the brassica oleracea, which is those ones I mentioned, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and so on. Um, turnips, rutabagas. Um, uh, those are all Chinese. Well, Chinese cabbage may act as an annual, depending on where you are and how, you, how early you plant it. Um, and in the beet family, beets and chard um, are uh, biennials. Uh, I'm trying to think which are the alliums. Most of the alliums are uh, onions uh, and leeks are both, uh, importantly, are uh, biennials that need to be overwintered. Um, I may be forgetting some, but basically the, those crops which you may plant a seed in the spring and by the fall, all you get is something to eat, but not more seed. Typically those are biennials and you have to the second year. This is some couple other things about biennials too is one is, I don't know about you, but I really like to get acquainted with my crops. I like to know the crops intimately. I like to know them from their 
birth to their death on my on my kitchen table. Um, I like to know what um, what their life is like. And when you just plant a carrot seed and you get a carrot, it's like you only knew your children until they reached adolescence and then you never saw them again. Um, by growing these things to their second year, you get to really understand what a carrot is, what a root of it. Again, you see them in their big glorious selves, not just the cute little bulb or little plant that you put in a salad or something, but you get to see the whole plant. And moreover, most, I don't know, maybe all of these biennial things, uh, as I mentioned, they're very prolific seed producers. That's because therefore they're also very prolific flowers. Although, albeit most of them have teeny little inconspicuous blossoms. They don't have big showy blossoms for the most part. Um, but they have very uh, profuse uh, flowerings and nectar producing. And that's important because it attracts all kinds of pollinators, wasps, bees, serpents, all kinds of things. And some of those things that are, it attracts are at other stages of their life are very beneficial to your garden. They may also destroy pest insects. Just for example, parsnips. Even if you don't care at all about saving seeds from parsnips, you really ought to have some parsnips somewhere in your garden uh, or often next to your garden uh, going to seed because they will attract, among other things, surfed wasps. There's little, also called hoverflies, little tiny little wasps, which at other stages of their life are, they're a very uh, effective predator against, I'm thinking it's aphids or maybe something else. They're very handy to have around. And it's a small price to pay for their labors on your behalf to leave a few nectar ne plants and nectary available to them. Um, so there, it adds a whole new dimension to your garden, saving seeds, including biennials. Um, I'm probably forgetting a lot of uh, specific aspects of this, and I'm hoping in your questions, you're gonna bring some of them to mind because there is a lot more to it. But as I said, the, the key things are, um, these are things which you have to provide a winter, but not a typical main winter, a milder version of winter that they can get the message that they're not immortal, but on the other hand, be able to survive to their seed stage. It's very important when you harvest them that you're not cut off the spree and don't damage the growing part of it because then they're generally done in. Um, keep them in a good place, which is cold enough, but not too cold, damp enough, but possibly not too damp. Um, I would just add on another thing to what I said about cabbage, uh, cu cutting the sides off. There's another way of doing it, which I've often done. Just recently, a friend of mine in Vermont was telling me she was doing it, had, looked like she was having a lot of success with it. Let's say you cut off or snap off the cabbage head, but leave the whole core at the base of it and simply put that in the cellar. I've done it, had very inconsistent luck. Often I've had good luck, but I've had broken surface will either dry out or sometimes it will rot, go either extreme or the other. If it survives, um, then, then it will let the lower part of that stalk will send out flower, um, flower stalks and it will make lots of seeds. So you can have your cabbage and eat it too. Um, okay. Um, those are the things I'm thinking of for the time being. I'm wondering if this would be a good time to go to questions. Yes, let's do it. Um, I just want to remind anyone who just joined that you can put the questions in the bottom on the Q&A feature of the chat and then I will ask them um, to Will for you all. Um, right now, I have a few questions. My first one is, what are there any crops that are successfully overwintered in central Maine? Are there any that you would rely on like overwintering in the garden? Uh, yeah, and I, I mentioned most of them. Um, parsnips, no problem. No problem at all. I al almost always do them in the garden. Um, parsley in Waterville, I think you'd have pretty good luck with parsley in the garden, particularly in town where you have, you know, buildings around and you, you know, you have some protection. Um, kale will often overwinter in the garden. Most of the other cabbage family things will not. Um, let's see. Carrots usually will with a little bit of protection, sometimes without any. Um, most of the others I'd be nervous about. I've had chard, Swiss chard. Uh, I have uh, several rows of Swiss chard and maybe four or five plants make it through the winter. Um, and often it was because they had so much foliage on them that I hadn't got around to harvesting that they kind of self mulched that stuff rotted and laid on top of them and gave them some protection. But um, a little bit of mulch can help an awful lot. And I would emphasize a little bit of mulch because again, 
it doesn't take a lot of mulch to give you the effect that you want without giving of the rodents. To every mulch, then you're going to have rodents in there. So a very light mulch can make a big difference. Incidentally, uh, hay is not always the best mulch. Hay and grass, sometimes shredded leaves, um, not whole leaves usually, but shredded leaves can um, also work very well to give you enough protection without make, making a haven for your pest animals. Um, but most of the other things I'm thinking of in a waterfall area um, as where I am here, you'd be really well advised to dig them up and put them in, put them inside somewhere. That makes sense. Um, okay. Another question I had was when you were talking about the self-sterile plants. Um, I'm just curious, is that a genetic response to the need for diversity? Uh, Katie, you're trying to steal my thunder for next thing. As I want to go into a great deal of detail with this. And yes, I will tell you enough, uh, hopefully to, to, to make you want to come back. Um, but that's you're, you're getting right to it there. Um, the um, self-sterile, because, because there are some plants, this is important, um, some plants, not all plants are self-sterile. In fact, some plants can pollinate themselves. See, the self-sterility is basically an anti-incest mechanism, which, which basically serves to exactly as you said, de demand diversity. Um, inbreeding depression, which is another fancy word for incest, has actually has an advantage, but it has a big disadvantage, is that it thwarts diversity. Uh, it makes means that you, uh, if you have some kind of a gene which is at all deleterious, a harmful gene in there, this is the same thing as with incest in humans. Uh, some gene which ordinarily would be bounced around in the population from generation to generation and rarely have any effect on anyone because it has to be combined with another gener uh, gene that someone else has. And if you're, if you're uh, reproducing with your brothers and sisters, you're going to be a much greater chance. And the same thing with brother and sister carrots, that you're going to be uh, taking some kind of a harmful gene and putting it together and getting effect. You can also get a super plant that way, or a super man, or super, per super organism, because the good things gather. And um, when in a pollination which is readily, uh, in a population which is readily outcrossing all the time, um, you always have this shifting around of genes which is good for diversity, but there's a downside of it. I'm gonna be going into more detail next time with this, but some things, uh, there's always a possibility that you get some particular combination of genes, which is wonderful. And then you immediately you lose it in the next generation. If you follow me, you wanna you want capture this gene and keep it, this combination of genes. And so some things like peas and beans, for example, are a good example, as in lettuce, they self-pollinate. So beans and peas could sell, could, you, could, you could save a very small number of seeds uh, from a small number of plants year after year and not worry about, and they're also self-pollinating. They're having sex with themselves. The, the, the pea blossom has both boy and girl parts. By the way, I always avoid terms like stamens and pistols and all that kind of stuff. I don't speak Latin and, um, and I find it too, too daunting. So we all know how we do it. We saw it boy parts and girl parts. And so peas have both boy parts and girl parts, unlike us. They've got both parts and they can do it to themselves. I know everyone starts you know, getting embarrassed and stuff like that, but that's, that's, that's not be judgmental here. They have their, you do it your way, they do it theirs. And they, um, and they can get pregnant by themselves and make offspring and not be harmed by it. They can do it generation after generation and not have the, the um, incestuous, you know, the, the byproducts of incest. Other things can't do that. Save seed from a small number of corn plants for even a single generation and you start getting run down. It's getting the opposite of heterosis. You're, you're getting the, the opposite of hybrid vigor. You're getting inbreed depression, and and that ain't good. So uh, again, it helps. It's a lot of these things that I will say about uh, general plant propagation. Uh, you need to further clarify uh, which plant we're talking about. What's true about a carrot may not apply to a pea or to a corn, and so forth. All right. Um, so we are out of questions, it looks like. Is there anything else for the last two minutes that you feel like you haven't covered well? Um, anything at all? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very obvious that I, I didn't do a very good job. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more questions. Um, maybe someone else will pop up with one. But uh, um, yeah, we've 
we've I've kind of covered the basic idea that I want to share with everyone that I'd like you to go, as I say, when I'm growing and offering all of these seeds, and we have this great embarrassment of riches in this country with seed companies offering hundreds, hundreds, thousands of varieties of things are available to the gardener. And for that to be more sustainable and stable over time, it's very important that gardeners learn to, because facilities like mine, which preserve genetic diversity, um, thousands of varieties and much bigger things like the thing in Svalbard, you know, the island in the Arctic, um, these are formidable repositories of genetic information. They're very valuable, as, particularly as a backup. They call it the doomsday vault. But they, on the other hand, like my scatter seed project, they represent a heck of a lot of eggs in one basket. And as important as they are, and it's a very important as a vehicle for sharing these things with people, ultimately, the best way of preserving genetic diversity is in the horticultural landscape of your and my farms and gardens. And that's why I'm so eager for people to um, learn to do this themselves. And again, not just saving seeds, start with the simple ones, but as much as quick as possible, move on to the somewhat more complicated things like biennials. We also just got another question, Will. So I'll ask you this one. Um, what varieties are most endangered right now? Yeah, that's that's too much of a question to answer. Actually, if we if we, if you could keep me on the air for another ten hours, I might begin to scratch the surface. Um, it's not so much particular varieties; it's genetic diversity as a whole. Um, there are lots and lots of varieties that are very much in danger, and some of them you might one might say, "Who cares?" If it's that much danger, it's probably because it wasn't that great, because not that many people wanted it. Maybe or maybe not. Um, but as far as specific varieties. Um, I think, the, well, there's a group which are the most of those ones which are not and perhaps never have been in any commercial seed catalog. The so-called heirlooms that you would find, uh, I would say to your reader, some variety that your neighbor or some guy up the road, some farmer keeps going. Those are the most endangered ones because those are perhaps not in any government collection. They're not in my scatter seed project. They're not in any commercial seed catalog. If you can locate any of those and identify them and you keep them going and share them, then those, then you'll be, well, you'll be doing a very great service to yourself and to the gardening community of mankind. I can't say if any particular varieties that are particularly, in one sense, one might say they all are. All right. Um, thank you so much. We have a, also a thank you from Corbin. He says, that you're through the eyes of a stranger really made a difference in his life. So he's really grateful. And we're really grateful to have you here. So um, thank you all for coming. And we will have one more talk again um, three Thursdays from now on June 3rd. And that one will we'll get into more of the, the question that I tried to answer, to, tried to ask before. So come back for more, definitely. And thank you all for coming tonight.